Bell to your road. Isabel Beja. Welcome to Crown the Beja Short Stories and Poetry for January 12, 2024. I'm Terence O'Donnell, your Irish scullet. Come in and sit down next to the fireplace and get warm for a wee bit while I read you a couple of stories and one poem. And that's what I've got. Three short stories and I got one poem for you this week. The poem is about children and how fast they grow up. Then I've got a fantasy story and it's actually part one of a three-part story. Another about relationships and dating, which will kind of catch you by surprise, and Robert J. Lombre's seventh chapter from Sanctuary. So my family is here visiting this weekend, so I'm putting things a little bit of on pilot a bit. Um, I'm going to kind of set the show up to go out on Friday as like it's supposed to, but the newsletters might be a little bit off. I might, I'll try to get them out tomorrow like I'm supposed to be, uh, but we'll see what we can do between all the family activities. So let me get to my first story this week. It's called They Dance Away and Grow Like Weeds Toward the Sky from Catherine Oceano. And she published this in The Lark. The girls drift like the last sunshine crawling across the grassy yard, disappearing behind the trees, a line shifting with time. They've grown. They grow more. I see them next and they are taller, changed, evolved. Once a bag of dress-up clothes was enough. Now Taylor Swift and Avatar can script their minds. They retreat to another room, make necklaces of beads they painted, talk about school and dreams, and tell stories not for adult consumption. Like the long fronds of grass at the end of the lawn, they wave and bend, drifting in and out of sight. They are no longer drawn like moss to a flame, to me, to my lap, or my transient visits. I'm not carrying them forward or holding their hands. Across the house I watch, as their bodies sway to their own music, to the days and weeks of their lives that pass more and more quickly. It's an ache of life that surrounds me, like the arthritis that pains, watching these grandchildren grow. Like weeds, they stretch up these descendants who come behind, one red-haired, curly, pink-cheeked, the other dusky, arrow-straight, blue-eyed. Both creative, one daring, both caring, dreaming, scheming. Who knows where they go, these blossoms of spring turning into what they will become, framed by the walls and shape of their home, by the parents who adore and pour love, kindness, and compassion. And I will be an observer, and love too, until the day that I am no longer, but for now I am still here. The gift that our descendants bring is that of the journey that continues, when those who are part of us find their way into the world, wherever that might be. Now, next, I have a story. It's a bit long, and the other the other stories I have for you this week are a little bit longer than normal, but it should be good. This one here will, will, will surprise you. It's called In the Shade of an Apple Tree by Natalie Gaspar. She published this in Imogene's Notebook. As Liza straightened the pleats on her favorite blue dress, she decided not to introduce herself as a widow. The last two men she told gave her such looks that dinner was over well before it started. Tonight, she was doing a favor for a friend. He couldn't afford to scare her date off. Satisfied she was presentable, Liza tucked a stray curl behind her ear and grabbed her grandmother's wicker basket before heading outside to the family orchard. She supposed a couple of dozen trees wasn't really an orchard, but it was such a pretty word. Liza liked to surround herself by things that were pretty, like her great aunt's gold and pink china or her mother's antique gold bracelets. Liza ran her fingers over the felt-like leaves of the newest tree. She began growing it two years ago after her husband's death. The others were grown by women in her family, all from seeds. Liza went to the first tree her mother had grown just after her father died. She plucked enough apples from its still slender branches to make a cobbler before heading inside. Everyone calls them red, but they aren't re not really. Everyone always ignores the flecks of sunset orange, muted yellows, and soft lime greens that turn an ordi otherwise ordinary fruit into a beautiful speckled rainbow. As Liza turned the fruit over in her palm, the afternoon sun bounced off the apple skin. It looked shiny enough to be made of glass. She smiled. This is why the evil queen chose an apple to poison Snow White. They were too beautiful to resist. 
The doorbell rang, so Eliza placed the apple back in the basket and straightened her pleats one last time before answering the door. Jason, so glad you could make it tonight. Jason was unremarkable in every way. Put him in a lineup at a police station under those harsh fluorescent lights, he'd be indistinguishable from every other 40-something who went to state college to be and became an accountant. Dull brown hair was heavily greased to one side, probably hiding an emerging bald spot. In his hands was a small bouquet of wildflowers. The flowers were poised in front of him like a peace offering. You look pretty. Liza took the flowers, pretending to smell them. Make yourself at home. Jason shifted his weight as his eyes flitted around the various rooms. He looked between the small kitchen table that her grandfather had carved and the large cushioned chairs in the living room. Liza waved him into the living room, and as she grabbed two glasses from the cupboard. She didn't drink much, so the only glasses she had were a pair of antique Rydell glasses her father had gotten her mother for their 12th anniversary. Her mother, dark circles beneath her eyes, hair frizzy from the late August heat, collapsed on a couch after making dinner. Liza brought a cold cloth from the kitchen and gently dabbed her mother's forehead. A smile formed on her mother's cracked lips. Honey? Her mother shot upright as she'd been struck by God. Her father walked in carrying a box wrapped in gold paper tied with a sparkling bow. Dinner smells wonderful, he kissed her mom. I got something special for you. Happy anniversary. Her mom took the box with a gentle smile, peeled off the bow, handing it to Liza. Inside was the most beautiful pair of crystal wine glasses Liza had ever seen. They're beautiful, darling. Thank you. At night, after a hearty pot roast dinner, her mother and father drank on the couch, sipping red wine from her mother's new glasses, watching with content smiles as Liza played with her doll. Jason shuffled awkwardly through the hallway. He paused at the edge of the living room, staring at his shoes. After a few moments, he sighed and kicked off his loafers. They must have been nice once, but the dark brown had faded to cream-laden coffee, and the seams were ripping apart. Lisa frowned. Her mother wouldn't approve of fetching the newspaper in those shoes, never mind showing up for a date with him. Lisa, Liza, fetch me the sewing kit, her mother called from her bedroom. Liza tucked her doll under her arm and went to the hall closet. She unfolded the step ladder, which squeaked under her weight, and wiggled the sewing kit loose from the top shelf. It was heavy and cumbersome. She shuffled back towards her mom's bedroom as she dragged the sewing kit along, her doll sitting on top. Her mom was curled up on the closet floor, clutching a black dress with cream details to her chest. Is something wrong, Mommy? Mom sniffled and wiped a tear from her eye. No, my darling, I'm just sad because your father tore my favorite dress and I have to wear it to a party tonight. Will you grab a needle and some black thread? Liza fumbled with the latch and sifted through the messy kit. She didn't like when her parents went to parties, because that meant Mrs. Grimley and her broccoli casserole becoming over. Why did Father rip your dress? Liza watched as her mom, her hands trembling, threaded the needle and began stitching the sleeve back on. It was an accident, my love. I tripped, and your father reached out to prevent me from falling. Great house. I love the view of the trees out back, Jason called from the living room. Liza drew herself away from the shoes and grabbed a bottle of wine from a shelf in the hall. It's been in my family for generations, passed down from mother to daughter. As Liza poured the wine, Jason drummed his fingers against his thighs, his right leg bobbing furiously up and down. Here you go, Liza said. Jason tried to nonchalantly dab the sweat beating on his brow as he reached up for the glass. Thanks. He took a nervous sip and placed a glass on the table beside the chair, one her grandmother had picked out in a flea market. Its edges were warm and rounded with edge, leaving the glass unbalanced. The glass teetered on the edge before crashing to the ground and shattering, shards flying in every direction. A pool of wine slowly soaked into the beige shack carpeting. Jason jumped to his feet. I'm so sorry. Let me get a towel. I can... It's fine, Liza said, with enough force that Jason stopped mid-leg lift. You're barefoot. I don't want you to get glass on your foot. Liza grabbed the towel dangling on the dishwasher and quickly sopped up the wine. The carpet was due for a deep clean anyways. She cupped the towel in her hands and stepped around the shards to the sink, bringing the towel, mesmerized as drops of wine fell into the sink. Mom, we're going to be late for the ballet, Liza called as she knocked on the bathroom door. The class started in ten minutes and her bun was a wreck. 
Madame Fleur despised tardy students, and Liza didn't fancy another day of mopping the studio after class. Liza, sweetie, Mommy had an accident and needs the first aid kit from the kitchen. Can you grab it for me? Liza harumped and stormed down the stairs, slamming her shoes on each step. She climbed onto the counter and grabbed the kit from above the spice rack. Taking the steps two at a time, she knocked on the door louder than was necessary. Just leave it on the floor, darling, and go get my purse and a snack. I'll be down in a minute. Liza turned to walk away and instead hid behind the frame of her bedroom door. She clasped her hand over her mouth when her mother cracked open the bathroom door. A hand towel soaked with blood pressed her head. Tiny drops slipped from the edge of the towel onto the bathroom floor. Liza cleaned up the glass. Jason rambled on about his flag football team, which seemed to lose a lot, and a pottery class he wanted to take. Liza, yes? Would you like to come with me to a class? Liza dumped the remaining shards in the trash can. The pottery class? I know it sounds boring but my sister takes them all the time and loves it. There's one next Thursday, Jason said, his eyes fixated on his bare feet. If you want, that is. Liza gave Jason a noncommittal smile as she gracefully pushed herself under her feet and grabbed the vacuum from the closet. Do you mind? I need to check on dinner. I made pot roast. Jason nodded eagerly and took the vacuum. The loud whirring noise soon blocked everything out. She considered Jason as he fought with the vacuum while standing on the couch. He teetered from side to side, one foot sinking into the burnt umber flower upholstery, then the other. She pulled the pot roast from the oven. The savory smell of roasted tomatoes and garlic wafted towards her nose. I'd like that, she called to Jason when he finally turned the vacuum cleaner off. Jason gave her a large, almost goofy smile. Nothing about him was as she expected. It seemed Jason was more successful at eating roast than he was at drinking wine. She was fascinated by the way he cut his food into identical bite-sized pieces before blowing on each one and placing it slowly in his mouth. Most of the bench she had to dinner shoveled everything in like it was some sort of a race. Jason glanced up from his plate and looked at her, unblinking. You've got some gravy right here, he pointed to an indistinct spot on his right cheek. Liza's cheeks grew warm as she grabbed her napkin from her lap. In her haste, it slipped from her grasp and floated to the floor. Allow me. Before Liza could protest, Jason dabbed his still pristine napkin into his water glass and wiped the gravy from her cheek. She was surprised by the gentleness of his touch. Everything about this man was surprising compared to the way Samantha had described him. Liza had bumped into Samantha, an old tennis friend from high school, a few weeks back when she was shopping for a new bunt pan. As Samantha had prattled on about her new sales job, Liza couldn't help staring at the gigantic bruise on her face. Samantha fell silent when she saw Liza staring. She said it was her husband, Jason. He didn't mean to do it, but every once in a while he'd get mad, stress over work, while with the upcoming nominations for promotions. Samantha sheepishly asked if Liza wouldn't mind going out with him a few times until after he heard about the job. Keep him occupied. Maybe make him her family's famous apple pie. Liza had embraced Samantha, said she'd be happy to help. Watching as Jason methodically wiped the gravy, then dabbed her cheek dry, it was hard to believe this was the Jason she had been told about. Seems I wiped away some of your makeup, Jason said. Liza touched her cheek and quickly found the offended patch. I'll be right back. Her chair scraped against the hardwood floor as she headed for the bathroom. Jason caught her arm as she moved past him. You don't need makeup to look beautiful, you know. You'd be just as stunning without it. Makeup is the mark of a proper woman, she replied, unsettled by his compliment. This time, Jason held her gaze for a moment before releasing her hand and focusing on the dirty dishes in the kitchen. Maybe I'll get started on those while you freshen up. Liza nodded once and disappeared around the corner to the powder room. She slipped inside, closed the door, and turned the lock. A shaky breath escaped her lips as she grabbed her makeup bag from the white wicker shelf above the toilet. Facing the mirror, she slowly dipped her brush into the smooth, caramel-colored liquid, taking just enough to cover the now bare spot on her cheek. Liza sat cross-legged on the bed, watching her mother through the open bathroom door as she laid out all her brushes and powders and mascara. Why do you wear makeup, Mom? Her mom turned and smiled, but it didn't reach her eyes. Makeup is the mark of a proper woman, Elizabeth. Liza flinched at the use of her full name. 
Above all else, it is important to learn to keep up appearances. Makeup means you can look beautiful even when you feel otherwise. And how you look is how people will think you feel. and conceals more than an uneven complexion. Liza scrunched her brow, trying to understand what her mom was saying. Her friends at school told her makeup was to attract boys and to make you yourself look nicer than you really did. But you don't wear it all the time, so why tonight? Her mom straightened her shoulders as she applied her foundation. Because your father and I have an important dinner tonight, and I need to look my best. As Liza got up to leave, she noticed her mother's reflection in the mirror. Her right cheek and eye looked like they had been painted purple with shadowed streaks of black and red. A sweat struck with the brush, and the bruise began to fade. Her mom caught Liza's eye in her reflection. There are some things we never show the world, she whispered. When Liza reappeared from the bathroom, the table had been cleared, the dishes cleaned, and the table set for dessert. What a lovely surprise. Jason's cheeks flushed as he smiled. It's the least I could do after that wonderful meal, he did, hesitated. I was going to get dessert out, but I didn't, I didn't want to pry. Liza straightened the pleats of her dress. Even if you had, you wouldn't have found anything except a bowl of apples, fresh from the orchard. I'm going to make us a pie. Can I help? Blackwater family tradition, I'm afraid. No man allowed. Why don't you go outside and enjoy the orchard? The apples are quite beautiful in the sunset. Once Jason disappeared between the trees, Liza grabbed a large knife from the drawer, one that was heavy in her petite hands. Her grandmother had once told her it was important to feel the weight of the blade, otherwise you would mar the skin and ru ruin the sweet fruit inside. In a swift practice motion, Liza turned the apple on its side and cut it in half, exposing the pentagram of seeds at its core. She dug them out one by one and placed them into a small glass jar for her next tree. Liza watched as her mom sliced through the apple with a firm flick of her wrist. One by one, she used her manicured nails to dig out the seeds and dropped them into a jar. If you're making a pie, shouldn't you use green apples? That's what Mrs. Brighton says. She makes the best pies. You have to use red apples, Liza, because they're so sweet, her mother explained. Liza watched from her rickety stool as her mother carefully chopped the apples, mixing in salt, lemon juice, cinnamon, and a spoonful of white powder from an unlabeled jar. We Blackwater save this for special occasions, Liza. What's special about tonight? It's no one's birthday or anniversary, and Father's teams haven't won anything. Her mother gave her a sad smile, running her fingers through Liza's unruly hair. This is to celebrate your father hitting me for the last time. Liza ran her thumb across the smooth glass as she removed the unlabeled jar from the cupboard and added a heaping spoonful to the bowl. She wondered if her mother would be proud of her. Her husband had met the same fate when he slapped her one night after drinking too much. She knew better than to wait it out like her mother had. Liza poured herself a glass of Glenfiddich, something she reserved for special occasions, and sipped it as the smell of warm cinnamon and apples radiated throughout the house. Jason wandered back inside, no doubt lured by the smell. He opened his mouth, and before he could offer to help, Liza pointed at a chair and pulled a pie from the oven. She cut him a generous slice and scooped some vanilla ice cream on top. For herself, she took only the ice cream. When she placed the plate in front of Jason, he looked unsettled. Are you lactose intolerant, Aunt Liza asked? No, I love ice cream, and I love apple pie. I just... Jason paused as he wrestled with something. You've been so kind to me tonight, and all I've done is make messes and break things. Liza opened her mouth to say something, but wasn't sure how to respond. A long pause filled the room. I haven't been honest with you. Liza shifted in her chair. You're not a pottery-loving accountant? Jason started. I'm married. Lisa feigned surprise and let her spoon clatter to her bowl. Jason went pale. It's not like that. I mean, my wife knows I'm here. She encouraged me, actually. This time, Liza's surprise was genuine. Your wife asked you to go on a date? Jason slumped his shoulders and fell back against the back of his chair. I didn't want to. I love Samantha. But lately, well, more than lately... She's been cheating on me. I found out a couple of months ago and begged her to stop. She refused, said I'm not enough for her. Liza clenched her teeth and stared at the pattern on the tablecloth. She thought it'd be good if I started seeing other people, too. And when she met you at the supermarket last week, she thought you'd be good for me. Why not just divorce her? Tears well up in his eyes. I asked, he said quietly, but she refused. It's our prenup. She doesn't get access to her trust fund unless she's married, so I'm stuck. 
lies of all her hands, that rotten two-faced liar. When I met Samantha, she had a large bruise on her face. Jason gave her a knowing nod. Her tennis partner plays rough and served one right into her face hard enough to crack her cheekbone. She's always gotten bruises the way she plays, but never that bad. Jason stared at Jason, who fidgeted in under the intensity of your gaze. I can go. No, please stay. I've had a good time tonight. Liza flashed him a pretty smile and he relaxed. Great, me too. Jason picked up his fork and cut into his pie. Don't! Liza swiped the plate away and carried it to the kitchen. Something wrong? I just remembered I accidentally used a gluten-free, low-sugar egg ingredients. That's how I make it from my neighbor. Poor thing is diabetic and a celiac and allergic to everything. This pie won't be any good. Lisa dabbed the ice cream off his slice and put it back in the tray. She quickly sliced up the rest of it, furious that Samantha had taken advantage of her, of her past, of her family's secret. I don't mind. You went to a lot of trouble to make that. Liza smiled at Jason, her first real smile of the night. No trouble at all. I make it all the time. Tell you what, I'll, dro I'll go drop this off at her house and then pick us up some tarps from Giano's. Sounds good. Liza wrapped the pie and grabbed her keys. It was time she paid her old friend Samantha a visit. As Liza started the car, she wondered where she'd plant her new tree. My next story is a fantasy story from Jonathan Sawyer, published in the Kraken Lore. And it's entitled The Heart and the Harvest, a novelette in three parts. And this is part one. Hello! Lady L never quite understood why she called out every time she came here. She knew Mallory would be alone. Nobody else in the entire kingdom knew about him. And though she knew she was expected, it just didn't seem polite to enter his home unannounced. She always thought he liked such subtle niceties. Come in, come in, came Mallard's booming voice from deep within his dark cave. It's always wonderful to see you, Lady L. Lady L smiled. She dropped her rucksack full of food and lifted the hem of her lavender dress as she navigated the rubble gathered about the cave entrance. Last week, her mother scolded her for the dirt on the bottom of her skirt. She had been questioned where she had been walking and even earned two rounds from the belt for it. She berated herself for not having been careful enough. She wouldn't make such a mistake again. And it's good to see you too, Mallorette. The cave was nearly pitch black, and he, he preferred it that way, and Lady L's eyes failed to adjust to the ambience. The leather sandal slipped on a wet stone, and she fell hard, hitting her left stone on the stony ground. She felt it bleeding without looking, and she whimpered in pain. But she shrieked at the sound of her dress tearing. Oh no, she cried, my dress! It was her best gown. Her father would give her a healthy lashing with the belt for ruining it. Her injured knee barely registered now. She fought hard to keep the tears away. Oh, Mallorant mourned at the sound of Ladiel's trepidation. I'm sorry. I always forget that you cannot see in the shadows as well as I can. Here, let me remedy the situation. With a great heave of his lungs, Mallorant let loose a, a blaze of radiant fire from his snout, the flames catching a grand chandelier hanging above the cavern and setting its tired, stubby candles alight. The chamber appeared out of the darkness, warm, a, the warm-lit, oddly decorated space Ladiel had come to love. Mallorant's huge figure appeared out of the darkness as well. A thousand pounds of lizard-like scales of greens and blues, two muscular hind legs, and two front claws. It was far from hideous. His scales reflected the light differently at times, appearing as light as a spring green and as deep as carulean and every shade in between. Lady Al always thought he looked beautiful. Now, let me see that knee. Can you walk? Her response was a frustrated groan as she shifted to a proper sitting position. The process brought a twinge of pain from her knee once more, but she tried to ignore it. The dress was the casualty. I'm fine, but the dress, it's ruined. Her mother had worked dutifully as a servant in Lord Cantor's estate for six months to afford the dress as a birthday gift for Ladio. Mallorant sighed with mild frustration. Never mind that. Now hold still and let me treat with your injury. With a little ungainly effort, he knelt down, still towering over her, and placed his two front claws over her left knee. Ladiel noted how remarkably gentle he was for such a large creature. Suddenly there was a flash of light that appeared underneath his talons, and it hummed faintly, growing in size and intensity, until finally dissipating after several seconds. Ladiel felt a rush of energy pass over her as the light faded, and she felt rejuvenated, like she had just woken from a good night's rest. 
Is that any better? he asked with lingering concern. Lady, I was amazed at his healing magic, but the dress was still more important. Yes, but my dress. I know I shouldn't have worn it here, but I wanted you to see it. Now that her eyes had adjusted to the candlelight and her knee was once again useful, she forced herself back onto her feet and examined the damage herself. The thick streaks of dirt were one thing, but her lavender gown now sported a tear the size of her thumb, running from her ankle to her hips. She continued to groan. I sense a flogging in my future for this. I yell, Mallorat roared angrily. You sounded like your father, she thought. I should thank you to not think like that. Every cloud has a silver lining, Ladiel finished for him. Yes, I know the saying, but I can't fix this tear. She frowned and hung her head. What will I tell mother? Malloret now sat himself upright, towering over Ladiel like he were part of the mountainside they were nestled in. Don't feel down. It was a simple accident. I mended your knee. Now let me see what I can do for your dress. I have some clothing there in the closet. Put on something that suits you. Is that a fair deal? She knew she was probably overreacting, but she knew the loss of that gift would pain her family deeply. Mallory could always find the brightest of a dark situation, and she found courage in his constant resolve. Still, despite his gentleness when he healed her knee, his large claws and talons hardly seemed appropriate for the delicate procedure of sewing. He caught on to her hesitation. I will take another form so I don't tear your fine gown to shreds, he chuckled. Without further warning, Mallard's giant, scaly figure melted into the nimble frame of a human male. He looked half the age of Ladiel's father and had only a thin beard, a few locks of short, curly auburn hair, and wearing his handkerchief, normally tied about his thick neck, as an oversized robe covering most of his body. She knew that he could take the forms of animals. He had done so previously on many occasions. But this is the first time he assumed the shape of a human. She watched in awe as he examined himself in his new form. It's been many years since I've taken this form, he explained. You could walk right into the capital city and no one would think twice of your disguise, Lady O smiled. Mallard only nodded slowly. My kind often used to wander the cap great capital streets in their human form before the... His voice trailed off and he swallowed hard, but with a great cleansing. Lady O shuddered at the mention of the great cleansing, a topic Mallard commonly avoided. She knew that it happened long before she was born, almost 200 years ago, according to the books she had read. She had even asked her parents about it, but the books were vague on the subject, and her father simply told her it was the time that the Red Knights defeated the last of the demons and saved humanity from the ravenous appetites. Malarut remained silent about it, but Lady O wasn't stupid. She knew that Malarut's kind were the demons of the history books. During his frequent daytime naps while she tidied his cluttered home, he often mumbled in his sleep about his brothers and sisters, how they died upon the lances of the knights. She presumed he dodged the subject to spare her the gruesome details and him the pain of remembrance. She sometimes wondered if he blamed her and her people for the deaths of his family. He would never say regardless. So what has kept your mind occupied these past days, dear Lady You haven't visited in nearly a ten day and have been left to dine alone. She had forgotten about the rucks out of food by the cavern entrance and started for it before Mallory quickly moved towards it instead. I'll set the table. I think I've gotten the hang of where everything goes. You change out of your dress. She was amused by how agile he was in his human form. Normally, he rarely moved around his massive home. Thanks, she replied as she headed over towards Mallory's favorite nook. He often told her tales of the strange treasures he found around the nearby hills and fields while in his animal forms, all of which he brought back to his well-stocked crevasse. He had also fashioned a wardrobe closet out of a small broken wagon, storing a dozen or so articles of clothing. One of them immediately caught Lady Ol's eye, a tunic adorned with an assortment of tiny gems, all held together by gold threads woven into each seam. Pretty, she muttered, as she pulled it out of the wardrobe, already trying to forget her accident. It was a fair bit too big for her tiny frame, but she held it up to her chest anyway and consulted a tall mirror nearby. I thought you'd like it, Mallory called from the entrance. Rucksack in his hand, right hand, he hopped from rock to rock to the back of the cavern, jumping and landing with both feet in front of Ladio. I found it in the hills last week. It needed some cleaning, but it looked almost new after a good scrubbing. It's quite beautiful. Try it on, he suggested. Ladio laughed loudly. 
is made for an adult twice my size, she replied. In fact, it's more appropriately sized for you than me. She placed it in a wardrobe, carefully folded. Valera left her alone in this trinket-filled nook to change into one of the more fitting pieces of clothing he had laid out some of the food she had brought for lunch. Malora left her alone in his trinket-filled nook to change into one of the more fitting pieces of clothing while he laid out some food she had brought for lunch. He set two places at his table, and after a moment to re reconcile the positions of the knife and fork, continued to unpack the lunch. She had brought breads, fruits, and a vegetable dish of some sort that would likely need preparing, a skill still beyond him. He would eat it as it was, though. He was starving. He rarely ate, preferring to spend his time meditating, reading, or exploring his neighborhood as a badger or eagle. When Ladiel had stumbled upon his mountain home some months ago, he feared that he would have to run away to avoid a certain death. He believed he was the last of his kind left roaming the earth, and the knowledge of his survival would surely incite one final cleansing. But her intrusion had been another accident, and when he tried to hide from her, she had demanded, quite forcefully, that he show himself. She hadn't even gasped at his frightening appearance, his scaly skin, his tail and wings and toothy maw. She behaved like one of his own, and since that day the two had developed a strong friendship. Though he had never had children of his own, he considered her a daughter of sorts, and tried to reinforce her sharp mind with wisdom from his own years. Lady L, he spoke up through the curtain he had erected for her, have I ever told you about the story of the great hide? No, her voice was muffled slightly by the rustle of clothing. Tell me. He smiled. She would never turn down a good story. Well, when word of the great cleansing reached the ears of the leaders of my kind, they decided to use our shape-changing abilities to save some of us. Our children, to be specific. Lady Hill's head appeared from around one side of the curtain, her dark blonde hair flapping in the air from the mo sharp motion. You had children? she asked quickly. No, but many of my brothers and sisters did, Malarut responded. She nodded and pulled the curtain back into its original resting place. She had changed out of her damaged dress into a pair of oversized trousers and a black shirt that fit her well enough as a dress. We use all of our power to disguise our children to look just like you. Ledio folded up her dress and placed it on a nearby stool and took a seat in one of the wobbly wooden chairs by Mallard's equally decrepit dining room table. A worn woolen rug underneath it scratched again her feet. Like human children? All of them? Her eyes widened at the implications? Yes, he nodded. We smuggled them all around the kingdom, in the capital, and in small towns like yours. He recalled the vast undertaking the procedure required. Though history was always embellished a little, the great hide was truly great. It was a miracle the plan wasn't discovered. She set to work preparing the vegetables. To his surprise, she was crushing them for use as a spread to put on the bread. How he loved to try new foods. So there could be many of your kind still within the kingdom. Sadly, no, he answered, his voice sounding heavy once again. The children had no memory of life with us, and without that knowledge, they were no more like us than they were like you. But some may still be alive, right? Ledio passed half a muffin with the vegetable spread to Malloran. He accepted it eagerly. Possibly, but it's not likely. Our bodies are just as frail as yours are. We grow old, break bones. No, I'm quite certain they're all gone now, he lowered his head. She took a bite into her half of the muffin. That's an awful story. Malarut nearly spat his muffin out in his attempt to respond. This habit of chewing completely before swallowing was peculiar, although it did allow the flavors to dance upon the palate. It's a wonderful story, he corrected. It's a story of hope. Even in the dark, good things may thrive. That silver lining I mentioned, however small, is always present. That's the lesson to be learned. She took a moment to consider his words, as she often did after one of his tales. She enjoyed hearing them, but loved pondering their implications and consequences most of all. Most of her friends her own age were eager to move on after storytelling, but Lado could consider the weight of the words for days and days on end. She could tell if Mallorod enjoyed the process as much as she. Well, she said, changing the subject with one more immediate practical application, would you mind changing back into your normal form now? I could use the fire to heat up some tea. Ledio pushed open the front door into her family's small thatched roof home, entering the warm common room and bathing in the scents of her mother's cooking. Her curfew was sundown on days she wasn't working with her father in the fields. Glancing over her shoulder, she caught the yellow sun a moment before it slipped below the horizon. 
Lady Elnamara, you're cutting it close tonight, aren't you? Her mother called from the stove in the middle of the room. Thick smoke rose from the cooking fire, and two large pots simmered over the flames. It's time for our evening meal. Help set the table before your father gets in. Sunset was the common time for families to celebrate the day's accomplishments and share one final meal before rest. Though the lunch she shared with Mallory was very filling, her mother's cooking had a way of bringing forth anyone's appetite. Lady O walked into the pantry, a small section of the room that had been cordoned off with heavy drapes on all but one side. It housed their dry foodstuffs and cooking tools. She collected three clay bowls and then called out, Will Marcon be joining us? Her mother answered yes, and Lady O grabbed a fourth bowl from a wooden crate and brought them with a handful of spoons to the grand oaken dining room table in the far corner of the cottage. It had been a gift from Lord Cantor for her father's hard work in the fields, and the family cherished it to no end. Even with heavy use, the varnish was barely worn. Her father walked in from the side door leading from the fields, followed by Lady O's older brother, Mark Hen. Both were heavily tanned from working in the fields all year, almost as dark as their beards, and their muscles rippled with home power. Ah, Lady O, her father's voice roared, even though he spoke pleasantly. Enjoy your day off? Day off, Mark Hen cut in immediately with a teasing sneer in Lady O's direction. Look at how pale she is. I think she's been getting a few too many days off, father. They both erupted in laughter, so the whole family was involved. Lady O knew the joke was hardly at her expense. Although her time away from the fields was her own, she knew her father deliberately kept her from tilling his soil to give her time to visit the town church and his library. Her parents understood how sharp her mind was. She was a prodigy for a child of only some ten years, and saved every coin they could in the hopes of sending her to the university in the capital. They only had her work the fields when there were no other hands to spare. Her mother's laughter slowly faded after a long moment. All right, you two. I think you've teased her enough for one day. She appeared next to the table, bearing a large pot of stew, still steaming and bubbling from the stove, and placed it on two strips of wood atop the table to protect it. She has set the table, and now will will fill it. Come. Without further encouragement, the entire family took their seats and bowed their heads, their hands clasped over their hearts in the traditional fashion. Great Lord, Laudio's father began, closing his eyes tightly with fervor. We give praise to you for another successful day of work. We give praise for the weather our crops will need to grow strong and plentiful. As always, we're thankful for this magnificent evening meal, and we're thankful for our wonderful children. Keep them safe and secure from temptation, Lord. The whole table chimed in in the final line of the prayer. Safety and belief. Eyes opened. All hands immediately moved for the cutlery, eager to dive into the delicious-smelling stew that awaited them. Being the youngest... Lady O was served first, as she thanked her mother and quickly set about devouring the meal in her bowl. By the second bite, the near-boiling stew had scalded any sense of taste from her mouth, but she didn't care. She had faced the dilemma countless times before, to eat without tasting or waiting for it to cool, but the anticipation always got the better of her. She recalled from the first mouthful how it was supposed to taste, and her mind did her best to recreate the wonderful flavor. Her mother was modest, but her cooking expertise rivaled anyone Lady O'll ever met. Nearly the entirety of her life was spent cooking. Three full meals each day for her family left little time for anything else. Yet somehow she managed to clean the house, tend the family's small spice garden, and lead the town's choir at church every week. Sometimes Lady O'll lamented her future as a scholar. She'd gladly give it up to be able to cook such foods all day. So how are your studies progressing? Her father asked from across the table, interrupting her thoughts. Because I believe your mother would like you to join her in choir service at the harvest celebration next week. Lady Hill's eyes widened. She had completely forgotten about the harvest. Each year, as the autumn stretched to a close, the entire kingdom would celebrate the harvest, the one day out of the year where every person would partake in the collection of the year's crop and party through the night. Only if you're not too busy with your schoolwork, her mother added. Lady O started to make a face, but quickly thought the better of it and drew a neutral expression. Her teachers at the church couldn't keep up with her, and normally took her a day to complete work for the week. They now had her copywriting text for a circulation, which ine inevitably led to her dis decreased attendance. They didn't mind, though, she mused. She stressed them out with her sharp and absorbent mind. You know I can't sing, Mother, she said. Her mother nodded with a curt smile. I know, but I thought you could help me conduct the concert. Lady O's jaw dropped. Leading the choir was quite an honor. 
Her mother worked for months to earn that privilege. I'd love to, was all she could think to say. She understood the reason her mother purchased the gown she was wearing as a birthday gift, all in anticipation for the harvest. She was happier than ever that Mallory had performed such exacting repairs to it. Her mind suddenly flashed to Mallory. Not only would he adore the stew, she thought, but he might also like to come to the harvest. It would be nice if he could see her at the front of the chorus. She made the decision to invite him next week. She smiled and speculated on the fun she would have as she quietly mouthed spoonful after spoonful of her mother's piping hot stew. So as I said, that's part one. And I will do part two for you guys next week. Now my last story is chapter seven. Sanctuary. Bertha becomes head of household. A secret in the supply shed. By Robert J. Longpre. Carrie arrived at the cabin compound by mid-afternoon. After unloading the jeep into a separate conveyance, which would take the supplies through a disinfection chamber that didn't use moisture, he went through the series of decontamination rooms and tunnels that ended up with him finally emerging into the cabin. No sooner had he emerged from the stairwell when Anne flew into his arms. Dad's getting better, she rushed to tell him. Mom thinks he will be discharged in two more weeks. She hopes to be able to go home at the same time. That's awesome news, Anne, Carrie said with enthusiasm. Thank you so much for helping Mom get online. It helps both of us. It'll make waiting for the time when we're all back at home together so much better. Carrie reveled in the real smiles that appeared on Anne's face. He hadn't seen her smile that much since she found out her, that her father was sick. Carrie's mother appeared moments later to give her son a hug and offer him a late lunch. Your dad wants you to go to the supply shed when you're fed and watered. He said there wasn't a rush, but that you should go there first before catching up your online classwork. Bertha was lurking in the background, listening. A meeting of the adult women living in the cabin had resulted in Bertha being voted in as head of the committee, the head of the household. Leah had only received Anne's vote, which resulted in a final vote of three to two. Bertha didn't trust Leah because she was Dorian's wife and would likely do everything he told her to do. Leah hadn't done anything yet to justify Bertha's feelings. Walking up to the group of three, Bertha interrupted. Annie, Carrie, it's time to go to the learning center and work on your lessons. Carrie looked up at Bertha with a questioning furrowing on his brow. Carrie, you missed a day and a half of lessons. You'll need to catch up. I will catch up. Don't worry, Bertha, Carrie replied. But I have a meeting with my father once I'm finished eating. Your father has authorized me as head of household. You can talk with your father later when lessons are done for the day. Leah spoke before her son could say anything to make the tension worse. You're right, Bertha. He does need to catch up on his lessons when he falls behind. It's just that he was already three days ahead of schedule before he left yesterday morning. Still, it is online learning time, and that's where both of these two need to go once Carrie is done with his lunch. Bertha was appeased by Leah's support, though not how that support was expressed. Bertha thought Leah was somehow condescending while appearing to agree. Carrie immediately noticed the tension between the two women, turning to look at Anne with a questioning look. Her response was a slight shrug before she spoke up. Let's get to work on our classes, Carrie. Carrie didn't get to meet with his father until after the four o'clock dismissal by Bertha. He wasted no time in rushing to the supply shed, hoping his father would still be there. It was with relief when he saw his father, Ben, and Carl busy in the building. Ah, there you are, Dorian said with a hint of laughter in his voice. I see Bertha finally set you free. What's with that, Dad? Carrie asked more than a bit and a half after at being treated as a child by Bertha. She's not my mother. It is what it is, Carrie. For now, you'll just have to accept it. It will take time for Bertha to learn that the world, and men in particular, at least here in the compound, are not her enemies. She had had a rough go of it before we rescued her and her children. So, what do you want to talk to me about? Carrie asked, dismissing the talk about Bertha. Well, it's more about what we want to show you. You're a man now doing a man's work, taking on a man's set of responsibilities. Follow me. Dorian touched a panel on the inside of a cabinet. The panel could only be seen when a wooden slat was removed. Not unexpectedly, a slight noise indicated that a lock had been disengaged. With not much effort, a portion of the cabinet opened up to reveal a smooth corridor that gradually descended. A soft glow of light appeared as soon as Dorian entered the corridor. Once all four of them were in the corridor, Carl brought Carrie's attention to a circular activation switch, which he pressed to have the door closed behind him. Anyone entering the supply shed will see nothing amiss, 
Carrie's father explained as they continued to walk downhill. What's the secrecy, Dad? This is feeling more and more like some sort of science fiction novel than real life. Where are we going? It's easier to explain by showing it to you than it is by talking about it, was all Dorian gave as an answer. The corridor seemed to go on forever. Carrie couldn't tell how far underground he had gone or how far. As they continued to walk down the hallway, the lights ahead would turn on, while those behind would be extinguished. Finally, the group of four stopped at an opening circular in shape and big enough for quite a few people. Along part of the wall was a bank of empty shelving. Carrie watched as his father, Ben and Carl, disrobed and placed their clothing on shelves. Your turn, Carrie. Just like in the decontamination unit to get into the house, we need to go through a decontamination chamber before we can proceed, Dorian explained. Once he stood stripped bare, his father instructed, touch this button. He touched a button on the wall, which was at eye level, and wasn't surprised to see a door open in the wall. Carrie was the first to enter into a long chamber. As soon as Carl entered, he turned the, to touch a similar button, which closed the door. A faint hum was followed by a pulsing wave of light that bathed the four of them. When silence returned, another door automatically slid open. Carrie followed his father through the door. Once the door closed behind the four of them, Dorian gave an audible command for access to some unseen receiver. With a gentle hiss, another door slid open, revealing a small compartment with seating designed for no more than eight people. You'll need to sit, Carrie, while the pressure equalization is completed. Once that is done, we'll be, a, we'll be able to enter our destination quarters. What about clothing, Dad? For now, we won't need any. Besides, we won't be here long enough to make it worthwhile to get dressed. It took less than five minutes for a bell to be sounded and for a final door to open. Carl, we'll leave the door open as we'll be returning in just a few minutes, Dorian said, with a confirming nod by Carl given in response. So that's chapter seven. And again, next week, I'll bring you the next chapter. Um, so it's starting to kind of get a little kind of kind of spooky. So that's all I've got for you this week. I hope you had enjoy your weekend, and I'll talk to you next week. Guru Mahogat, thank you for listening to the show today. I hope you enjoyed it. I try to offer everyone a variety of stories and poetry each week. Maybe something to touch your heart a little bit. Disclosure for everyone. In order to read the complete stories and poems, you'll need to sign up for a subscription in Medium. If I see a link by the author on one of the stories to allow everyone to read it, I'll let you know in the newsletters. Please return again next week for another episode of Cron de Beja Stories and Poetry. This once-a-week podcast is available to listen to in nearly every podcast platform out there, including YouTube. Share this podcast with your friends and relations. The more the merrier. Search for Cron de Beja Stories and Poetry in your favorite podcast app. Subscriptions are still free, but I do have a donations tab on the rss.com webpage and on my website at www.cronnebeja.com. I appreciate any support for my efforts to bring these stories and poems to you. I hope I've achieved my goal in helping you feel like we've been sitting under the tree of life together. As a Shauna Kate, I want to continue to delight you with a story or a poem that may bring you a smile or make you think a little bit after we part for the day. As I say goodbye this week, I wish to leave you with this Irish blessing as you go about your day. Bless you and yours, as well as the cottage you live in. May the roof overhead be well thatched, and those inside be well matched. Shlongo foil, which means goodbye for now in Irish. <laughs>